This hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Africa and Global Health will come to order. History was made in Zimbabwe last month when Robert Mugabe's nearly four decades long rule over Zimbabwe came to an abrupt end. Initially deposed uh, uh, by the military and placed under house arrest, Mugabe refused to resign. His ZANU-PF party removed Mugabe as its leader and replaced him with Emerson Manangagwa. Now, days later, Mugabe resigned just after Parliament began impeachment proceedings, and Manangagwa was sworn in as Zimbabwe's new president on November 24th. And news of Mugabe's resignation prompted celebrations in the streets of Harare, and even among Zimbabweans living outside the country, all of whom hoped that uh, Zimbabwe's days of living under a strong man were over. Those of us who watch Zimbabwe closely are also hopeful that this marks a turning point for the country that has suffered complete economic devastation under a dictator who stifled dissent and trampled basic uh, human rights. Zimbabwe has a new president, uh, but the critical questions of whether the new government reflects material change from Mugabe's decades of rule and what path uh, Zimbabwe is likely to take under President Manangagwa, these are things still left unsettled. President Manangagwa is not unknown to us. Uh, until his dismissal as first vice president last month, he'd been closely allied with President Mugabe since Mugabe's rise to power. He stands accused of orchestrating a string of massacres in the early 1980s uh, to consolidate Mugabe's power, uh, leaving as many as uh, 20,000 people dead in Matabili land. His cabinet picks uh, have disappointed many who are hoping for a new coalition government. His selections included military leaders who participated in the military takeover and holdovers from the Mugabe regime, but nobody representing the opposition. There's been much speculation on what policy changes Manangagwa might take, given the dire state of uh, Zimbabwe's failing economy and the critical steps needed to repair it. Today, the subcommittee will hear testimony from four distinguished experts on Zimbabwe. Each brings a unique background and a wealth of experience uh, with them. Uh, I thank each of you for your time and sharing your expertise with us. I know that uh, each of you have uh, rearranged your schedules to travel to Washington for this hearing, and uh, on behalf of the committee, I thank you for it. Um, and uh, let me just say, as a personal note, uh, I uh, lived uh, in Zimbabwe for a time in the early 1980s, uh, at a time there was great hope uh, for this new democracy. And that hope faded uh, sometime in the 90s, and uh, it has become a nightmare uh, for so many uh, Zimbabweans uh, living there and their families abroad. Uh, I hope that uh, this marks a turning point, and what this hearing is really about is to find out what policies we should adopt here in the United States Congress to ensure as much as we can uh, to nudge at least uh, Zimbabwe toward a democratic future. So thank you for being here, and I'll turn the time over to Senator Booker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Did you say you lived there in the 1950s or? Yeah. <laughs> 80s. 80s, OK. OK. Um, I want to thank Chairman Flake uh, uh, for holding this timely hearing. Uh, it's something I'm really grateful for. This is truly a historic time in Zimbabwe and a pivotal moment in the United States bilateral relationship with Zimbabwe. For decades, Congress has played a key role in the U.S.-Zimbabwe bilateral relationship, most notably through the Zimbabwe Democracy and Recovery Act, or ZDERA, passed in 2001, which aimed to address persistent human rights violations and governance challenges by prohibiting U.S. support for multilateral and bilateral debt relief and credit for Zimbabwe's government. Much of the world, including the people of Zimbabwe, were optimistic last month after President Mugabe was ousted from power, closing nearly 40 years of author authoritarian rule. Uh, it is the hope of many, including myself, the transition from President Mugabe to President Emerson Unumgagwa has represented a renewed opportunity for democracy, transparency, and accountability for the government, and most importantly, for all the people of Zimbabwe. However, I'm concerned that despite the promises made by President Mungawa, the, to rooting out corruption, to having free and fair elections, and to overseeing an inclusive government, there is simply not yet enough proof that this regime will be any different than the one before. We know that President Mnangagwa 
has announced a cabinet stacked with former close associates and military officials. In addition to, that, to them being involved in past atrocities, many cabinet members also have serious corruption allegations against them. This raises questions about the government's commitment to a new, democratic, renewed path forward in Zimbabwe. And although President Mnangagwa promised an inclusive and representative democracy for all Zimbabweans, the opposition remains left out of the government, seeing an ominous sign about the prospect for real change for the country. The new government of Zimbabwe and the international community must address the yet unanswered calls for justice and accountability for the victims of past horrific atrocities reportedly committed by members of the now new government. Perpetrators of the brutal cleansing of political opposition in Matabeleland, a region in the 1980s, in which 20,000 people were killed, still have not been held accountable after all of these years. Thousands of Zimbabweans still live with the physical and psychological wounds of this violence. As we examine the future of Zimbabwe, one benchmark on the horizon is this August's elections. Free, fair, and credible elections that are transparent, free from intimidation, and in which the opposition is allowed to organize, campaign, and safely run their candidates must be the signal the U.S. and the international community needs to lift some of the barriers to bilateral and mutual aid. This benchmark may in, effect, may in fact determine whether Zimbabwe is ready to capitalize on this historic moment. I thank our, thank our witnesses for being here. And again, as uh, Chairman Flake said, you all have uh, uh, crisscrossed the globes, changed travel plans uh, to be here to provide your very thoughtful, insightful testimony. I am grateful uh, for you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Booker. Uh, Senator Coons, would you like to say something? Senator Coons and I traveled to Zimbabwe almost two years ago. Um, thank you, Chairman Every Flake, uh, Ranking Member Booker. Um, I will never forget our memorable <laughs> uh, afternoon tea uh, with former President Mugabe. Uh, and I think many uh, have waited and wondered when the day would come uh, when Zimbabwe would have new leadership, as the Chair and Ranking have uh, framed, I think, very well. The question now is, what will the new government of Zimbabwe do? Will they take the steps needed in order to earn the trust of the world community? Uh, can we find ways to support um, movement towards real democracy in a truly open society or not? I'm very eager to hear from uh, our panel of uh, two panels of witnesses today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a chance to participate in the hearing. Thank you. We'll now turn to our, our witnesses. Uh, first panel, we'll hear from Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, Stephanie Sullivan of the State Department's uh, Bureau of African Affairs. Uh, she'll provide the administration's evaluation of recent events and the path forward to our bilateral relations with Zimbabwe. Uh, the second panel, we'll hear from Peter Godwin, uh, Tendai Viti, uh, Adiwa um, uh, Mavinkar, and uh, we know that uh, Peter Godwin, obviously an award-winning journalist, best-selling author, has written a series of uh, memoirs about his native Zimbabwe, where he was born and raised. I've particularly enjoyed those, those memoirs. Uh, Tendai Bidi, obviously former finance minister for Zimbabwe, current opposition leader, and Diwa uh, Mavinkar, an activist with the Human Rights Watch. With that, to uh, recognize Ms. Sullivan. Chairman Flake, Ranking Member Booker, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify today on Zimbabwe. The historic turn of events featuring Robert Mugabe's resignation offers an extraordinary opportunity for Zimbabwe to set itself on a new path. Today, I provide this testimony to discuss our bilateral relationship, the events leading to the transition, and the U.S. position on future engagement. Looking back over the past two decades, the U.S. relationship with the Zimbabwean government has been tense. The government's repeated violations of its citizens' rights its catastrophic economic mismanagement and widespread corruption were obstacles, making it difficult to engage effectively to address Zimbabwe's challenges. Deeply flawed elections in 2008 and 2013 further entrenched political divides in the country, diverting attention from much needed reform. Nevertheless, the United States has maintained a strong relationship with the Zimbabwean people. Since Zimbabwe's independence in 1980, 
we have provided significant development assistance in the areas of health, food security, education, and economic opportunity for citizens. Today, our assistance builds resilience by helping millions of Zimbabwe's people battle HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, food insecurity, malnutrition, landmines, and human trafficking. Additionally, civil society programs bolster civic participation to advance democracy, human rights, and governance. These programs are critical in enabling Zimbabweans to hold their government accountable. None of our foreign assistance involves direct funding to the government of Zimbabwe. Over the last two years, the competing factions within the ruling party, the Zimbabwe African National Union Patriotic Front, ZANU-PF, engaged in a bitter and public power struggle aimed at determining President Mugabe's successor. Grace Mugabe's rise in power unsettled others in the party who derived their legitimacy from their ties to Zimbabwe's independent struggle. These dynamics led to then Vice President Emerson Manangagwa's dismissal on November 6th. Military actions purportedly in defense of President Mugabe, the party, and war veterans followed. Over the next several days, the world watched as hundreds of thousands of Zimbabweans marched in the streets and parliament, parliamentary impeachment proceedings began. Mugabe resigned on November 21st, ending his 37 years of rule. The rapid turn of events appears to have unified the people of Zimbabwe around a sense of hope and possibility for the future. The change in government also offers an opportunity for reform that could allow the United States to re-engage in ways we have not recently been able to do. In support of the people, we will expect to see genuine economic and political reform, including free and fair elections in 2018, in accordance with Zimbabwe's constitution. U.S. engagement with newly inaugurated President Manangagwa and his administration must be based on demonstrated behavior, not merely rhetorical intentions. President Manangagwa has a window of opportunity to demonstrate his commitment to a democratic, just, healthy, and prosperous Zimbabwe. Our policy of re-engagement will focus on constitutional democracy, free and fair elections, respect for human rights and the rule of law, and an improved trade and investment climate, among other issues. The country has a strong civil society and an experienced political opposition whose voices must count in charting a path forward. The military needs to return to its barracks and state institutions should be demilitarized. Perpetrators of abuses against civilians should be held accountable regardless of party affiliation. The government must engage in hard economic reforms, including addressing budget deficits, reforming the Indigenization Act, and reducing corruption. We will want to see improved protection of fundamental freedoms, a freer media, and a truth and reconciliation process. The people of Zimbabwe deserve these reforms and many more. We welcome President Manangagwa's statement of intent to carry out economic reforms made during his, his inauguration speech, and we are assessing the budget released last week. We believe critical political reforms deserve equal attention and cannot wait. In particular, elections must be free, fair, credible, and inclusive, allowing Zimbabweans to choose their own leaders. Everyone in Zimbabwe should enjoy the right to peaceful assembly without undue interference and to voice their opinions and their vo voice and their vote without fear. We are working closely with international partners in Harare and our respective capitals. Similarly, the State Department will continue to consult with Congress, the White House, and other agencies on our policies regarding Zimbabwe. If President Monongagwa wants improved diplomatic relations and access to international and assistance and cooperation, particularly with the United States, his government must first implement reforms. The United States stands ready to help the government and people of Zimbabwe to achieve these goals. U.S. private sector members are eager for improvements in the business climate that will encourage them to invest and trade. They see promise in agriculture, tourism, energy, and mining. People-to-people -people exchanges are important as well. We will continue using our vibrant exchange programs to foster a better understanding of the United States amongst Zimbabwe's future leaders and vice versa. 
We will continue to encourage Zimbabwe's highly educated populace to study in the United States. And we will strengthen internal networks that build professional savvy and entrepreneurial skills. We believe in a stable, peaceful, prosperous, and democratic Zimbabwe that reflects the will of its people and provides for their needs. Thank you very much, and I welcome the opportunity to answer the committee's questions. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Uh, let me start out. Uh, you mentioned that uh, our relationship with the new president and the new government will be based on reforms that they've undertaken and on behavior and not just rhetoric. Uh, what do you make of the moves so far uh, with regard to assembling a new government and cabinet? Uh, as the committee has pointed out, uh, the government is composed of many people who were previously in the government. Uh, so it is a bit disappointing to see a lack of opposition members, uh, although it's not 100% clear that opposition members were ready to participate uh, in, in the current government. Um, we will look to engage with the government to continue to press for actual implementation of some of these uh, rhetorical um, signs of improvement in both the economic and political sphere. Taking a step back, uh, the, the Zimbabwean military went to great lengths to try to explain that this was not a coup, but rather a military realignment or some type of realignment. What are we calling it as far as the State Department goes? Um, clearly, there was uh, military involvement in events that led up to the resignation of President Mugabe. Uh, we have not labeled it a coup. This is a very technical term um, that uh, our lawyers and others are, are looking at at the moment. Um, normally, uh, if it's determined a coup, it would trigger a cutoff of direct assistance to the government. At, at the moment, we have no direct Right. Uh, financial assistance to the government of Zimbabwe. Yeah. Usually it's a pretty good rule of thumb that when somebody dressed in fatigues uh, who's just taken over the broadcast facility gives a statement. That's uh, usually what, uh, what, it, what it feels like. Um, with regard to uh, the behavior on the, or the changes that need to be made, um, we have an outsized influence, obviously, at the IMF and the World Bank. What do we plan to do with regard to, uh, there will be efforts made by some, some outside uh, governments and uh, organizations to uh, relieve uh, some of the sanctions um, and to, uh, to free up uh, money or funding uh, in the coming months. What will be our position? While we're engaging with the new government with an open mind, um, it's not enough to say it's a new government, so therefore uh, none of the sanctions or restrictions that were previously in place should apply. Uh, we will continue to um, look for signs of actual implementation. Um, for example, uh, the election that is coming up, uh, there are months and months of preparation that need to lead up to that, and um, we would be interested to see an openness or an invitation to send um, outside observers, uh, potentially as um, part of a group that might be led by an eminent African. Um, and these are things that would need to happen fairly soon and could give some indication of um, the intentions beyond the nice speeches. Do we have, uh, is there any, do we have any documents yet or timelines that uh, that we've put forward, or perhaps that we could look at that the opposition leaders or others have have, uh, have stated that need to happen in terms of uh, by this date voter rolls need to be completed by this date such and such has to has to come down. Is there anything that uh, that has been put together in that regard yet? Uh, we, we've not seen a, an actual timeline for leading up to the elections. Uh, there was encouraging news that the period for voter registration has been extended into February. Um, we are looking at um, what a lot of members of civil society have put forth as requests uh, or demands for the new government vis-a-vis uh, -vis actual democratic steps. Uh, and we are working very closely with our like-minded partners uh, and trying to remain in sync with, with them, both in Washington and Harari and in cap other capitals. Thank you. Senator Booker. I'm going to allow uh, Senator Coons to go first. Um, thank you, um, Senator Booker. Thank you, um, Chairman Flake. 
Uh, and thank you, Ambassador Sullivan. Um, it is uh, great to have an opportunity to talk with you and uh, to the next panel about uh, the transition underway in Zimbabwe and what the future might hold. As uh, Senator Flake referenced, we uh, met with uh, former President Mugabe in February 2016, and uh, like many, I was very pleased to see him uh, go after 37 brutal years. But um, I think it's critical that uh, the people of Zimbabwe not see one dictator replaced by another. Uh, and so uh, I, for one, am reluctant to see us take any steps uh, to lighten or relieve sanctions or other international restrictions on uh, loans or partnership uh, until we see, as you suggested in your testimony, concrete steps uh, by the administration of Emerson and Nagagwa and uh, any successors. So walk me through three things, if you would. What are the key milestones for us to watch for um, to get a sense of um, um, Emerson Nagagwa's uh, capacity and willingness to enter significant reforms? Thank you, Senator. On, as far as um, governance goes and respect for human rights, uh, we would like to see uh, immediate um, uh, implementation of freedom of expression uh, that has been lacking for decades in Zimbabwe, freedom of assembly. Uh, we are looking also for um, a free and responsible media, including social media, um, the preparations for the elections, that I, as I mentioned, um, anti-corruption. Uh, I believe they've given a 90-day window for people to return ill-gotten gains as an amnesty. Uh, will that happen? Will um, um, corruption be uh, pursued in an impartial way, uh, in an apolitical way? Um, how will things progress in terms of rule of law and due process? Uh, those are on the, on the um, governance side. On the economic side, um, the country is crumbling under crushing debt. Um, we also have a very low doing business environment there that is a deterrent. So we'd like to see a, an improved investment climate. Um, since investors vote with their feet, they are watching very closely uh, because there are potential opportunities there. Um, but investors want to be able to repatriate their, their earnings. Right. Uh, and again, the rule of law and a level playing field will be very important in the economic sphere as well. Thank in you. addition, in the uh, security sector, uh, we would like to see the security sector earn the trust of the citizens, and that would include police reforms. I was struck that the budget request for this year for Zimbabwe, if I understood correctly, uh, dropped 50, almost $60 million from the previous year and included no request for democracy and governance uh, programs. Uh, it's my expectation that there might be some reprogramming uh, request or some increased willingness to partner with the robust civil society and free press that you referenced. What sort of role do you imagine that uh, USAID and the State Department um, should play uh, in the run-up to free and fair elections if we are genuinely making progress? Um, all of our influence is not necessarily tied up with the dollar figure, um, but to address that point, we do have some um, flexibility with some regional funds uh, that we could target if we saw an opportunity that looked viable there. Um, I think that our, our diplomats have a wonderful opportunity to use the bully pulpit uh, to coordinate with like-minded uh, international partners, uh, and also to continue engaging with civil society organizations with whom um, we, we may not be currently giving assistance, but with whom we've cultivated relationships over the years. Because fundamentally, this will be about the people of Zimbabwe, uh, and we want to support their aspirations for a country that can reach its full potential. Last question. Um, so China has long had an active role uh, in Zimbabwe during the liberation struggle and to now. What do you see as um, their influence in Zimbabwe compared to the United States? What do you see as their trajectory um, in Zimbabwe? And what do you think are their interests or their priorities compared to ours? Um, I agree with you that this is essentially up to the people of Zimbabwe and the actions that will determine their future will be taken by Zimbabweans. But um, it seems to me that this is a moment for the United States to show a principal leadership, um, active engagement and interest, but I'm wondering what uh, another major um, influencer in this country uh, has in mind for their um, short-term agenda as well. Well, as throughout the continent, uh, China is very interested in um, resource uh, acquisition and uh, in their interactions with the various host governments uh, have 
taken a very hands-off approach in terms of what they might consider uh, undue influence or uh, foreign interference. Um, so we don't expect there will be any change in terms of um, China's approach, um, but I think we have a window for the U.S. to engage in a way we haven't been able to engage um, that will involve U.S. businesses, which of course are private and we can't compel them to, to engage the way um, others perhaps have an opportunity with the state-owned enterprises uh, to engage. Well, thank you, Ambassador Sullivan. Um, thank you, Chairman Flake. I, I think you'll see significant and sustained interest from members of this subcommittee and other committees of the Congress um, as we try and encourage and support a movement towards a genuinely open and democratic society in Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coons. Uh, Senator Udall. Thank you, uh, Chairman Flake, and, and um, Thank you for holding this important hearing. We really appreciate uh, you being here. On November 17, 2017, the Department of Interior uh, published its determination that Zimbabwe was sufficiently stable to allow for the legal importation of elephant trophies uh, into the United States. This announcement was based on ratification of a new conservation plan in Zimbabwe in 2016 in the opinion that trophy hunting adds to the overall conservation of the species. The announcement, however, coincided with the coup of former President Robert Mugabe and a transfer of power to his vice president, underscoring the great instability in the region. Because of these events, the president tweeted that he would put the policy on hold, uh, which I appreciate very much. Wildlife trafficking decimates iconic species while uh, funding global terror organizations. The chairman of this committee and I've worked hard to stem the tide of poaching and illegal wildlife trafficking across the globe, and I'm proud of our bipartisan work in the last Congress to provide agencies and international institutions the funding and tools necessary to stymie and interdict wildlife trafficking. But I worry that the current administration's findings for the elephant and the lion will undermine that progress. Do you believe that Zimbabwe has adequate institutional controls to properly manage wildlife? Um, that decision is um, currently being reviewed at the Fish and Wildlife Service in the Department of Interior. Um, as far as the stability or not at the moment, uh, we are taking very much a wait and see approach, um, but we're not sitting on our hands, staying home. We're engaging actively um, with members of the new government, with civil society, um, with other influential actors on the ground. Um, so I think the answer to that would be it's, it's too early to say what the level of stability is. And, and um, do you believe that in this period of upheaval, the government can regulate hunting of iconic species, including lions and elephants, in a manner that will prevent illegal wildlife trafficking? Uh, while there has been upheaval, there also seems to be a great deal of continuity uh, if you look at the cabinet that is currently in place. Um, so at this point, again, I would say that um, we're going in with our eyes wide open, uh, and this remains an area that we look at in terms of um, U.S. policy and also what it might mean to the Zimbabwean ecotourism industry, and they're looking for diversification of the economy. Um, this, you know, they have an opportunity to increase the 50,000 or so American tourists who go there. Um, and it's, so we're, we're just going to have to wait and see regarding their ability to um, manage. And this might be part of uh, security sector reforms that we could potentially look at. Yeah, th thank you for that answer. Me Media reports indicate that Zimbabwe's Electoral Commission chairperson, uh, Justice Rita Makaro, uh, resigned abruptly on Friday without any rationale. The press is speculating that she was pressured to resign, and opposition leader uh, Morgan, Morgan Chigangri uh, said that Makaro's resignation had opened a can of worms. What do you know about her successor and whether the change in leadership of the commission will make credible elections next year? more or less likely. Senator, I'd like to take that question back and uh, respond for the record. That would be good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Booker. 
Thank you so much. So I, I'm just trying to understand the administration's position, given things that are going on right now. You've talked about a lot of reforms that we're looking and waiting for, reforms on this coming election and how important that is, a desire potentially to send election observers. You talked about reforms in government, talked about reforms in the mining industry. Can you just tell me a little bit more about how, how you think we have, what leverage you think we have to ensure um, that, uh, um, that we can see, let's start with free and fair elections, to see that those elections happen. Is there any ways that you think we have to further leverage that or something that Congress could be doing? Well, I'll take the latter part of that question first, if I may. Um, uh, we certainly welcome engagement of Congress and um, travel to the region, uh, letters, engagement, and we will continue to work with you on, on the way forward. Um, as far as the leverage, uh, I think we, we see in place a new government that is uh, eager to have a sense of legitimacy that the predecessor government lacked, um, despite the fact that it's a lot of the same people. Uh, again, it offers an opportunity that we would like to um, try to work with and, and induce in a positive direction. Um, the country is having a severe economic crisis, and that is another point of leverage. Um, that uh, without the reforms, there will not be uh, good things happening on the economic front. And then finally, um, we are very tightly lashed up with our like-minded counterparts in country and uh, having ongoing discussions with them about um, the preparations for the election. So can I, can I interrupt you there? Sure. There have been reports that the British government may consider extending a bridge loan to Zimbabwe uh, in order to clear unpaid arrears and open up funding from the IMF and World Bank. Um, has the British government given you an indication that they plan to do this? Um, we don't have any uh, direct knowledge of that. We've seen some similar reporting. Um, Assistant, Acting Assistant Secretary Don Yamamoto was just in London this week. Uh, I'm positive that uh, Zimbabwe came up in the conversations. Uh, as far as I know, that specific angle did not come up, and we remain in a very united approach to this. Okay, great. Um, the uh, the accountability for atrocities, which is, um, I think, something that is, is, as I'm sure you agree, is of profound re importance. Tens of thousands uh, uh, have been killed uh, in numerous, uh, unfortunately, raids and, and, and operations and, and massacres. Church groups have documented an alarming uh, record of government-sponsored atrocities uh, before the 08 elections. Um, we, we see the State Department said in 2000 that Amangagua was widely feared and despised throughout the country, that's the State Department's words, and could uh, be an even more repressive leader than uh, Mugabe. Um, and, and so I understand that you're sort of having a wait and see and see if we can have inducements, but clearly when it comes to accountability for atrocities, if there seems to be so much compelling evidence that this is someone that participated in, there, in, in this, how do you uh, 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 level that? Um, with our policies towards this new administration? Well, one, one of the things we'll be looking for is um, for the people and government of Zimbabwe to organize some sort of a truth and reconciliation process uh, so that they can work through these traumas of the past. Um, as far as President Monangagwa, he remains under U.S. sanctions. Um, and again, we, this is the government that is in front of us right now, and we're going to try to work to engage positively. Um, he, in his inauguration speech, really wanted people to look forward and forget about the past. We're not going to forget about the past. Um, we're going to keep that in mind as we deal with him and other members of the government. Um, but again, uh, not just appeal to their better natures, but uh, try to help uh, the government and the people of Zimbabwe move forward beyond this very, very dismal past track record of human rights. And, and just, you know, be, be candid with me if you can, to expect a government led by someone who participated and was responsible for horrific violations, uh, horrific uh, human rights uh, atrocities, to expect there to be a real truth and reconciliation coming from a government led by someone um, who, who is this, uh, who has a record uh, 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 that, uh, that from our own State Department seems to be so horrific. Is, 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 should we as a, really be expecting uh, there to be a, a real truth and reconciliation process? 
Um, well, we, we certainly don't believe this will be a spontaneous um, course of action without a great deal of pressure and discussion. Um, and it's, it's not just the United States, it's also, as I mentioned earlier, the like-minded partners and a very active civil society. Uh, there were so many people out in the streets um, celebrating the prospect of a new Zimbabwe. Um, they have high expectations and, and we think in some ways, you know, maybe not dramatically yet, but the lines have moved and um, the kinds of uh, oppression that people felt uh, obliged to withstand in the predecessor regime, I, I think that there is, it's been a bit of a game changer, um, despite the fact that it's a lot of the same people who are running the show at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador Sullivan, for your testimony. We'll now um, turn to our other panel and give them a few minutes. So we'll recess for just two minutes while the new panel comes. Appreciate the, the answers you've given today. Thank you. This hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Africa and Global Health will now come back to order. Uh, subcommittee has just heard testimony from Pr uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Sullivan representing the administration's view. Now we'll hear from a second panel, uh, each of whom has uh, deep personal experience with Zimbabwe. In this group, we have an award-winning journalist, a former government minister, and an NGO activist. All have raised their voices in opposition to Robert Mugabe and the Zimbabwean government using different platforms all have deep roots in Zimbabwe. Two of the witnesses were in Zimbabwe during the military takeover. One is a former constitutional lawyer. Two have been human rights attorneys. Uh, all have strong personal interests, obviously, in Zimbabwe's future and are used, using their unique talents to raise uh, awareness of the issues and to change lives in Zimbabwe. Uh, first, we'll turn to Peter Godwin award-winning journalist, best-selling author, documentary filmmaker. He's written extensively about his own experiences growing up in Zimbabwe and of human rights abuses committed under Mugabe's leadership with the support of the new President Emerson Mnangagwa. Tendai Bidi is uh, currently a key opposition leader in Zimbabwe. Uh, he served as Zimbabwe's Minister of Finance from 2009 to 2013 as uh, part of the Government of National Unity he was a secretary general of the Movement for Democratic Change and is now president of the People's Democratic Party. As a former finance minister, Mr. Biddy uh, is uh, uniquely poised to address economic and corruption issues in Zimbabwe. Last but not least, uh, Diwa Mavingkar is uh, the Southern African director of the Africa Division of Human Rights Watch. In 2012, he co-founded the Zimbabwe Democracy Institute, a public policy research think tank in Harare. Mr. Mavinkar is also in, was also in Zimbabwe during the military takeover, uh, updating a wide audience via, via Twitter uh, on the events there. Uh, with that, we'll rep recognize uh, Mr. Godwin. Thank you, Chairman Flake, Ranking Member Booker, and other members. Thank you for inviting us and for being interested in Zimbabwe in a, a world where I'm sure you have many other things to distract you right now. Um, <clears throat> 
Just before dawn on November the 14th, General S. B. Moyo of the Zimbabwe National Army went on to state television to announce that Robert Mugabe was under house arrest. Mugabe's 37-year reign, he was Zimbabwe's only leader since independence in 1980, was over. Zimbabweans soon poured out onto the streets to celebrate. Mugabe had been unseated by an internal faction fighting within his ruling ZANU-PF party. It wasn't primarily ideological or even ethnic. It was essentially a family feud on steroids, and it pitted old against young. His wife, Grace, had made a, who made a bid to succeed him, is 41 years his junior, too young to have fought in the Liberation War, hitherto a sine qua non for leadership of most Southern African liberation parties. Her attempt to create a dynastic succession, a la Evita Peron, Imelda Marcos, or Madame Mao, proved premature. Over his 37 years in power, Mugabe had hollowed out ZANU-PF, reducing it to a personality cult by getting rid of anyone who challenged his authority. But Grace overreached when she persuaded her increasingly enfeebled husband to fire his vice president, Emerson Munangagwa, her main rival. This was too much for the military leadership, who had close ties to Munangagwa as he'd held defense and intelligence portfolios for much of his ministerial career. I think you can expect Munangagwa to be strongly in hock to the military, who after all elevated him to the presidency. In the end, this was a continuity coup to protect the power of the party's old guard. General Moyo, who announced the coup, is the new foreign minister, the country's official interlocutor with the world. Air Marshal Parent Shiri is promoted to the cabinet too. He was the officer commanding 5th Brigade at the time of the Matabililan massacres in the early 1980s. And it's speculated that General Constantino Chiwenga, head of the Zimbabwe National Army and architect of the coup, may be named vice president, <clears throat> may be named vice president. Even if not, he will continue to be the power behind the throne, the kingmaker. The veterans of the Liberation War for Independence are once again ascendant too. Their leader, Chris Mutsvangwa, has been named as special advisor to the new president. And what are we to make of the new president? You should expect Monangagwa to entice his own people and the world with the reformist stance. He will try to rebrand the party, presenting it as ZANU-PF 2.0, ZANU-PF light, non-ideological, technocratic, managerial, open for business, safe once more for foreign investors. He has already mentioned a partial return of land to some white commercial farmers. He has embraced the rhetoric of anti-corruption, offering a three-month amnesty window to return ill-gotten gains. But these promises don't stand up to scrutiny. What, for example, of his own corruption and that of many of the new cabinet, eight of the 22 on the US sanctions list, joined by bonds of massively corrupt self-enrichment and repressive political violence? For them to put distance between who they now purport to be and their nearly four-decade record in office is preposterous. And for Zimbabweans, as well as the international community, to believe this is to fall for, ZANU -PF, for, for a ZANU-PF confidence trick, a survival bait and switch. ZANU-PF has long been a vampiric entity, sucking the blood from the nation. Munangagwa is 75 years old. He's most unlikely to undergo a benign metamorphosis. He has been at the very center of ZANU-PF's repressive security web until recently Mugabe's trusted consigliere. He, is, he headed the feared Central Intelligence Organization, the CIO, at the time of the Matabililan massacre, during which upwards of 20,000 civilians were killed. And he rolled out the terrible reprisal campaign during the post-2008 election violence, when thousands of opposition supporters were badly tortured and more than 200 killed. All of these and more besides were carried out by this same political party, kleptocratic, violent, repressive. What are the alternatives for Zimbabweans in the 2018 elections? You have before you today a senior member of the main opposition party, the MDC, so I will defer to him to summarize his own party's current status. 
However, opposition fragmentation is enormously beneficial to ZANU-PF, allowing it a real possibility of, willing, of winning at the polls, even if opposition parties attract more votes overall. For the opposition, it is therefore imperative to unify or at least broker electoral pacts. It's also crucial that the elections are free and fair and perceived as such by the electorate. ZANU-PF has a long precedent of election foul play. If this is to be avoided in 2018, external monitoring will be essential. It is quite inadequate for observers to parachute into Zimbabwe shortly before the poll. There must be a persistent presence on the ground long, long before that, as registration procedures need to be scrutinized. In conclusion, if we reward Munangagwa's same as it ever was, ZANU-PF, for its internal coup, for example, by prematurely dropping individual sanctions, we would help cement the culture of impunity that already infects Zimbabwe, where the perpetrators never face the consequence of their actions and where real freedom and reform remain elusive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godwin. Mr. Biddy. Thank you, Chairman Fleck, Ranking Member Buka, and other members of the subcommittee. I come here with my colleagues from the Opposition Alliance, known as the MDC Alliance. I travel with uh, Honorable uh, Nelson Chamisa and uh, Mr. Jacob Ngarivumwe. We thank you for inviting us to this uh, uh, great center of American democracy. The 14th of November 2017 began a series of major life-changing events in Zimbabwe that will forever redefine the political and constitutional landscape of our country. On that day, military tanks invaded the streets of the capital, Harare, and in the early hours of the 15th, the military captured Zimbabwe's broadcasting houses and made it clear implicitly that the executive was no longer in control. On 18th November, hundreds of thousands of Zimbabweans marched alongside military personnel in the streets of Harare and Bulawayo and demanded the resignation of President Mugabe. On 21 November, in the middle of impeachment proceedings in Parliament, President Mugabe quietly, if not inelegantly, announced his resignation. With President Mugabe's departure, Zimbabwe now faces an uncertain future, but one which uh, presents real opportunities for reconstructing, rebuilding, and refabricating a new Zimbabwean story and a new Zimbabwean uh, society. Without a doubt, the 37 years of President Mugabe's rule were a sad story of capture, coercion, corruption, poverty, and delegitimization. Zimbabweans lived in fear under a system that paid no respect to their rights and a system that saw continuous impoverishment and suffering, loss of livelihoods amongst uh, ordinary uh, citizens. President Mugabe presided over one of the most autocratic African regimes that stood head and shoulders with the likes of current dictators like Obiang in Equatorial Guinea, Bia in Cameroon, Isaiah Afeweke in Eritrea, Al Bashir in Sudan, and Yoweri Museveni in Uganda. What we now need as a country is a genuine break uh, from a tortured past and not a continuation of the old order. The new Zimbabwe, which the majority of people that marched on the 18th of November 2017 crave for, has to be founded on the values and principles of constitutionalism, the rule of law, a just and prosperous society. And in the new Zimbabwe, every citizen must be free to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And we contend, Mr. Chairman, that our country is in the middle of a transition, a transition from a very unhappy 
a regime or for 13, 37 years uh, of the torture and pain that I've described above. But like any transition, it can be a captured transition. It can be a derailed transition. It can be a hijacked uh, transition. That is not what the thousands and thousands of people who marched on the 18th of November 2017 are seeking for. The, those people who marched in Harare, in Bulawayo, in New York, in Cape Town, in Johannesburg are looking for a fresh start, a genuine transition uh, to a new Zimbabwean society. But what is the precondition to move to this uh, genuine uh, transition? In our view, the starting point must be returned to true legitimacy, constitutionalism, and the rule of law. The roadmap to legitimacy is the fundamental precondition to the establishment of a sustainable, just, and free Zimbabwe. This roadmap must be anchored on clear benchmarks. These include, number one, the immediate restoration of constitutionalism, the rule of law, and legitimate civilian rule. The military must be demobilized from the streets. Number two, and very importantly, the implementation of genuine electoral reforms to ensure that the election of July, August 2018 is free, fair, credible, and legitimate. Those electoral reforms must include, number one, the preparation of a brand new biometric voters' row to which all political parties sign on to and agree to. Number two, agreement on an independent electoral management body, particularly in the postmath of the resignation of the ZEC chairperson, Justice Rita Makarau. Number three, and this is very important, the introduction of a diaspora vote. Zimbabwe has four, more than four million uh, of its citizens that are in their diaspora, and in terms of section 67 of our